The U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center's lecture series is presented to a live audience and provides insight into leadership and war fighting from scholars and soldiers, helping us educate future military leaders and the public. The opinions and statements of the speakers featured on this presentation are not necessarily the views of the United States Army or the Army Heritage and Education Center. Ladies and gentlemen, today is September 14th, 2022. And on behalf of the team here at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center and the staff of the U.S. Army War College, welcome to our second lecture of the 2022 fall season of the Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. I'm Chris Moore, and I'm the Chief of Patron Services here, and we'd like to welcome listeners from all over the world on our live stream feed. For those of you listening live online, remember that you can submit a question for our Q&A session at the end of the lecture by typing it into the chat room at any time, and we will include them in the discussion. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Megan Kate Nelson. Dr. Nelson is an expert in the history of the American Civil War, the U.S. West, and popular culture. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, Preservation Magazine, and Civil War Times. In 2021, Dr. Nelson was honored as an elected fellow of the Society of American Historians, and prior to 2014, Dr. Nelson taught U.S. History and American Studies at Cal State Fullerton, Brown, Harvard, Texas Tech, and Texas Tech University. She has also been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Megan Kate Nelson. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Chris. Um, and thank you to uh, Carl Warner for the invitation to come here and to speak to you as part of the Perspectives Lecture Series uh, and for wrangling me and all of my technology and all of the other things that have to get done um, when you are uh, bringing a speaker whoa, in from out of town. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I can't wait uh, for our conversation later about what it means to fight a war in the desert, especially in the middle of the 19th century. Um, so I did not begin my career as a Civil War military historian. I actually began it as an environmental historian of the American South. I wrote my dissertation on the Okefenokee Swamp in southern Georgia, uh, found ruins there, so became interested in destruction, which brought me to the Civil War for the first time, uh, wrote a book called Ruin Nation, which was about destruction in the war of uh, cities and houses and forests and bodies. And while I was doing the research for that book and while I was teaching Civil War histories, uh, I came upon these war, these battles, um, this far Western theater, battles uh, between the US and Confederate troops and between U.S. and Confederate troops and Native peoples in the desert Southwest. Um, so while I was looking into this, um, I started to notice that there were many, many different kinds of communities involved in this struggle uh, for this region during the Civil War. Uh, and in order to really encapsulate all of their experiences, I needed to talk about nine different communities soldiers and civilians, indigenous peoples. Uh, and in order to kind of handle the complexity of that, uh, and in order to also experiment a little bit with my writing style, I decided to write uh, what became the Three Cornered War um, as narrative history that's based in the experiences of individuals. So those of you who had read, have read the book, or those of you who uh, hopefully will read the book, uh, will find uh, that I'm putting you kind of on the ground with nine different people through the course of the Civil War in the Southwest. You're gonna to get to know them very well. You're gonna move with them through space and time. I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of them uh, tonight. Uh, there are nine uh, protagonists, although um, I have had readers point out to me that the desert is the 10th protagonist uh, in the Three Cornered War. So we'll be talking a great deal about that as well. Um, so when I was starting to write and research this, I, I also was really interested. I am from Boston now, but I grew up in Colorado. And one of the things that always interests historians is when you come across uh, an event or a historical development that you had never heard of before, right? And growing up in Colorado, 
I had never heard about these battles in New Mexico, about Valverde and Apache Canyon and Glorieta Pass. I did not know that Colorado soldiers were directly involved in the fight to defend the West against Confederate invasion. You know, and you're always interested in kind of how did that come about? How did this entire theater of the war, which determined the control of 40% of the nation's landmass, get functionally erased from Civil War histories and from the public consciousness, the popular American consciousness of the American Civil War? Well, I have a couple theories about why this is. First, traditional military history uh, has been and still is predominantly focused on the Eastern theater, um, predominantly Virginia. Uh, I have a friend who once showed a slide of you know, the seat of war and it just had Virginia and the rest of the map was labeled everywhere else, right? And that's exactly how it appears in a lot of, a lot of books and a lot of courses. Uh, there might be a little bit uh, on you know, the, the campaigns here in Pennsylvania, maybe a little bit of attention to Gettysburg. But other than that, uh, it's all about Virginia. Uh, some attention to the Trans-Mississippi, uh, but not as much. And to make things even more confusing, military histor historians have come to call the Trans-Mississippi the West which creates some problems, right? Because what is west of the west? What do you call that, right? <laughs> so what we call things matter, um, I have been advocating. I encourage uh, everyone here and everyone uh, watching the live stream to start calling the Trans-Mississippi the Trans-Mississippi uh, and call the theater that I am going to uh, talk about today the west or the far west. Military historians have also considered the Indian Wars and the Civil War to be two separate and distinct conflicts. Uh, when you look at the war in the Southwest, you kind of realize that those borders are not so hard. Uh, they're in fact much more fluid uh, and in very interesting ways. Native people took part in battles in this theater and in the Trans-Mississippi and in the Eastern Theater. 20,000 indigenous men served as soldiers or scouts or spies or quartermasters to the armies. Uh, in a kind of more informal way. Uh, and we don't know much about these experiences and we need to know more. Um, also, military historians uh, tend to be somewhat dismissive of the Southwestern theater because the size of the armies uh, in this region were tiny compared to the massive armies in the East. Uh, troop strength for the US was between four and 5,000, for the Confederates was about 3,000, right? Tiny. But as I will demonstrate later uh, with some fun data, uh, those small armies had outsized uh, effects on the Civil War in this region uh, and overall. Now, social and cultural and political historians uh, are also uh, partly responsible for this. They have mostly focused on the Eastern theater as well. Uh, if you're looking at the political history of the war, of course, you're gonna be looking at Washington, DC and Richmond two cities that are 100 miles apart, right, uh, in the mid-Atlantic. If you are studying emancipation and the experience of enslavement, of black soldiering, which is a huge and burgeoning and really rich field now in Civil War studies, these valuable studies also, um, for good reason, mostly focused uh, on the slave states of the Southeast um, and some, to some extent in the Trans-Mississippi, increasingly in Texas. And then those of us who are interested in civilian experiences are also focused really on where warfare was the most concentrated and destructive, which is also the Eastern theater, right? Um, so what happens when we finally do turn to the Southwest? What do we find in terms of a Civil War history? Why was this theater important uh, to the course of the war? in other theaters, and what lessons about desert warfare can we learn from it? Um, in the rest of this talk, I'll start to answer these questions for you, uh, but first, a little background. So in the spring of 1861, the real question uh, at this moment was, you know, why go west? When we talk about the coming of the Civil War, we are always talking about the west. We're talking about the Mexican-American War, the Wilmot Proviso, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Gadsden Purchase, 
Will there be slavery in the territories? Where are we gonna run the transcontinental railroad line? Kansas and Nebraska, how are they going to come into the Union along with New Mexico territory? California in 1850. We're always talking about the West and then the guns fire on Fort Sumter and it's like the West just doesn't exist anymore and that no one is ever concerned about it ever again. Uh, this was in fact not the case. Both the US and the Confederacy wanted control of the West and they wanted it really early in the conflict. So why was this? Three reasons. One, gold. As we all know, it takes money to fight wars, right? Uh, the gold mines of the Sierras in California, the newly discovered mines of Colorado in 1858 and 59, uh, and some inklings about what was waiting in the mountains of the Northern Rockies uh, were really driving a lot of people into the West at this time. Also a lot of young men who were prime military age, we're gonna meet one of those later, signed up uh, mostly for the US Army. Um, but both the US and the Confederacy needed gold. They needed money to fund their war efforts. The Confederacy in particular needed more money um, to fund their effort. The Confederacy also needed access to Pacific ports. The blockade had already been established. It was not yet working to full effect, but it would soon. If the Confederacy could move from their most western edge, which was El Paso in Texas, through this stretch of what at this point was New Mexico territory. Arizona did not exist yet. We're gonna see it come into existence here in a second. Um, but if they could march an army through that southern section of New Mexico territory, they would have access to the deep water ports of Los Angeles and San Diego, possibly even San Francisco. They could ship out their cotton they could bring in war material. They could have access to the Asian trade. What would that do um, in, the, in the Pacific for the Confederate cause? So this was particularly important to the Confederates and of course for the US, it would behoove them to keep those ports in their own hands. And then third, um, each side, the US and the Confederacy each had a vision of their future. And that future involved the West. For the United States, they wanted a West and a nation free of enslavement. They wanted an empire of liberty from coast to coast. The Confederacy wanted an empire of slavery. They wanted to expand their nation all the way to the Pacific, and then possibly use this area in the Southwest of New Mexico territory and Texas to launch an imperial campaign against Mexico, perhaps the Caribbean, perhaps Latin America. That was part of the vision, a hemispheric empire of slavery. So all of this was driving action in this theater. Uh, Texas sat, as I noted, at the far western edge of the Confederacy, and this is where the campaign for the West began. The war here had four phases. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly because we don't have a ton of time here tonight, but if you have questions uh, about them, I'm happy to answer them uh, during the Q&A or afterwards. The first phase uh, was a Confederate invasion in July of 1861. The driver of the first part of this phase was John Baylor who is, yes, of those Baylors in Texas. Um, his uncle was the man after whom the university was named. He was an ambitious, impetuous officer with no real military experience. He had recruited 300 men, 300 ranchers uh, from Texas for the Confederate Army and was rewarded uh, with his own company, the 2nd Regiment Texas Cavalry, or the 2nd uh, Mounted Rifles. And his orders were to take those men March along, we'll go back to the map if we can. Uh, march along the, the uh, San Antonio El Paso Road, which you can see moving uh, from San Antonio to El Paso. This is a military road that had been pounded out in the 1850s, had several federal garrisons along it. And his job was to march along it, take control of those garrisons, leave men behind um, to establish control of those forts reach El Paso, occupy Fort Bliss, and then wait for further orders. Now John Baylor was not a man for waiting. 
When he got to Fort Bliss uh, in July of 1861, he started to hear rumors that the Union forces or the US forces under ERS Camby were coalescing north of him on the Rio Grande at Fort Craig. Uh, he started to get nervous. And so he just decided to invade New Mexico territory. And this is another feature of this theater. Um, often officers just acted without orders. And they just explained their actions later in their campaign reports. They didn't even ask for forgiveness. They just explained what they were doing. Uh, and mostly, it was OK. Um, but Baylor crossed into New Mexico territory, took the town of Mesilla, forced the surrender of Fort Fillmore, which was the southernmost federal installation in New Mexico at the time. Um, 400 US soldiers surrendered to him. It was one of the first and most spectacular surrenders of the war. Uh, he paroled those officers because he couldn't feed them uh, and those enlisted men, sent them on their way north to Santa Fe, and then returned to Mesilla, sat down, and created the Confederate territory of Arizona, which you can see here on this map. This is one of the rare pieces of evidence that we have um, that people had heard about this action and understood that Arizona now belonged uh, to the Confederates. Now, it doesn't look like the Arizona that we're used to. Uh, Baylor created Arizona basically out of the southern one third of New Mexico territory. And as you can see, you can even see it on the map. It just looks like a funnel, right? It is just a funnel to California. And that is what it was meant to be. Uh, Confederate troops were meant to occupy Tucson, which sort of sat in the middle, and then move further west and set up a campaign for California, which of course was the big prize. So this is your piece of, uh, of cocktail party trivia. Say, so, do you know how the state of Arizona was first created as a territory? Well, it came in uh, first into the Confederacy before coming into the Union. So this was all good news, um, an excellent development for the Confederates and for Brigadier General Henry Hopkins Sibley, uh, who was recruiting troops with orders, I might add, um, for an invasion of the Southwest. Now, Sibley, you may have, heard, may have heard of before. He was quite inventive. He invented the Sibley tent and the Sibley stove. Uh, he wasn't good at much else, however. Uh, he was a drinker. He was extremely disorganized. He had great visions and no real talent for putting them into action on the ground. Um, so he was a career military guy. He resigned his commission at the beginning of the war, went to Richmond, and presented to Jefferson Davis himself his plan for the Southwest, which was that he was going to recruit 3,000 Texans, take them into New Mexico on their own horses. They were going to provide their own weapons and their own kit, so the Confederacy wouldn't have to pay for any of that, which was music to Jefferson Davis's ears. Um, they would, in order to feed themselves, kind of create initially a huge wagon train with a big cattle herd, but then they would forage along the road. Um, and they would, once they got to New Mexico, lay siege to the forts along the Rio Grande uh, in which US forces had cached forage and food for soldiers, war material, weapons, ammunition. By doing this, Sibley figured he could establish control of New Mexico territory and provide the ability to take that funnel uh, route right into California and then possibly also go north to Denver City and establish control of the Overland Trail, thus taking the entire West for the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis thought this was a great idea, gave him orders, allowed him to do it, and Sibley started recruiting troops uh, after Baylor had left in the summer of 1861. Now, key to this plan was that Sibley believed that he could gain several allies along the way. Anglo merchants and miners in the Southwest uh, who were mostly migrants from the South, mostly pro-slavery, mostly pro-secessionist. He was right about that for the most part. Mining towns in other areas of the West were not so 
pro-slavery or pro-secessionist. Uh, in fact, they were really divided and there were often fistfights that broke out at flagpoles as these soldiers were trying to either raise the US flag or raise some other kind of flag that was representing the Confederacy at that point. Uh, ultimately, most of them uh, went for the United States. He also thought Hispano civilians would come along with the Confederacy. They had been citizens of the United States for only 10 years. They had reasons to really resist or perhaps despise the US government. Uh, and they also had a very long established pattern of enslavement. Not black enslavement, but the enslavement of Navajo and Apache peoples, usually women and children. There's a very long pattern of raiding warfare in the region. Uh, and Hispano uh, New Mexicans had established both this and then also other forms of unfree labor for years. So Sibley thought they'll be on board with this part of the Confederate cause. What he did not take into account is that New Mexicans had seen an invading group of Texans before in 1841 when a group of 300 soldiers had sort of marched in from the Republic of Texas determined to take Santa Fe for the great republic. Uh, they did, never made it there. They were arrested, marched to Mexico City, and then expelled. Uh, and that was not so long ago. It was only 20 years before, right? And uh, Hispano New Mexicans were having none of that. Because this invading army was Texan, they were immediately not in favor. Sibley also thought the Mormons in Utah might come with them. The Mormons had already fought their own rebellion against the United States government in 57, 58. Uh, he thought they had this really great trained militia of two to 3,000 men already in Utah, and perhaps they could help. He didn't really count on Lincoln already going to Brigham Young and saying, listen, we'll stay out of your business if you stay out of our business. Brigham Young said, all right. So he did not join Sibley's crusade. Lastly, Sibley thought that native peoples along the route, Comanche peoples, Kiowa peoples, uh, and uh, Apaches, Chiricahuas, and Mescaleros, uh, Jicarillas, uh, and then also uh, the very large Navajo nation to the Northwest, the Diné, would join him. Uh, he was wrong about that. Uh, most native peoples, as we'll find, um, saw this white man's war as this amazing opportunity. Suddenly, there are thousands of people on the road, thousands of animals for them to raid and take back to their own communities. All of the soldiers had been withdrawn from forts in their homelands. This was like a field day for them, a real opportunity that they, in fact, exploited. They had zero interest in joining either the US cause or the Confederate cause. So as you can see, this is not gonna go well. For Sibley. Spoiler alert, this does not go well uh, for Henry Hopkins Sibley. Uh, after many delays, um, all of them due to Sibley's logistical incompetence, uh, the brigade finally left Texas in the fall of 1861 uh, with a huge cattle herd, long wagon train, um, and they arrived in El Paso around Christmas of 1861. So this began uh, phase two of the war in the West. Uh, Sibley's troops had to recover for about a month. Uh, they had marched 600 miles. This would be like an Eastern army marching from Washington DC to Atlanta, Georgia uh, in the Eastern theater. Um, they were mostly on horseback, but their animals were jaded by the time they got there. Uh, they were severely dehydrated and malnourished. They did not have enough food with them along the way, and they did not manage their water resources particularly well. So all of this uh, delay gave uh, ERS Camby uh, on the US side a lot of time to do what he did best, uh, which is to bring men together, to arm them, to feed them, and train them um, for a defensive position. Uh, so. Sibley began to move north. He knew he needed the critical supplies at Fort Craig uh, and decided that he was going to lay siege to that fort. Um, he pulled up there with all of his men um, February 19th, 1862, took one look at the 3,000 men who came out to meet him, decided, hmm, maybe a siege is not such a great idea. 
Uh, I don't have the advantage here. Uh, I am not on high ground. I do not have enough cannon power. I do not have enough men. So he decided to go around, right? Went to the east, crossed the Rio Grande, moved up north uh, to a crossing called Valverde, and that's where he met uh, a U.S. army uh, who was trying to prevent them from crossing. Uh, so this is the Battle of Valverde, the first major battle in the region between U.S. and Confederate troops. Uh, the Confederates ended up winning this battle. It took place along a riverbed um, along the Rio Grande. It was sandy and dune-like. Um, and this is, you know, as, as much as we say that these are tiny armies, this is about 3,500 uh, U.S. troops engaged against about 2,500 Confederate uh, in this small space. This was the largest military action that had ever been seen in this theater before. So this is something to to remember uh, when we're thinking about the Civil War's impact on Western history <laughs> is that these may be tiny armies in a larger American context. They are enormous armies in the context of the Southwest. Um, the men they met, across, the Confederates met across the battlefield um, were a really interesting U.S. Army. <clears throat> U.S. Army regulars who had been posted in the region um, for about 10 years at Frontier Garrisons. Volunteers uh, like Alonzo Ickes, who was an Iowan, uh, who had come west to Colorado as part of the gold rush in 1858-59, uh, had not really done particularly well in the gold mines, uh, was considering going home to Iowa and signing up for the army there, um, decided instead to stay for the winter, signed up for the U.S. Army in the gold camps, and mustered in just in time to march to Valverde and fight um, on behalf of the United States in defense of the West. Um, Alonzo Ickes is, a, is an interesting guy. He wrote uh, one of the few kind of full detailed diaries of the Battle of Valverde that we have, um, that we can look at. Um, this is what his diary looks like. Uh, it is at Denver Public Library. Um, he was a great source. He is one of the protagonists along with Baylor. Um, of the Three-Cornered War, um, as you can see, he has beautiful handwriting, which for historians is like, ah, yes, I can actually read this. Um, and the diary is in pretty decent shape. There's some evidence that he wrote in details after the fact, uh, which is an interesting component of these kinds of sources. Um, but one of the reasons uh, that this is you know, one of the few direct sources that we have a little bit later. Uh, this region, even though we have plentiful sources in the OR, we have battle reports, letters, you know, all kinds of, of documents on both sides, um, the material that historians use to access the Civil War experience, um, letters, diaries, other kinds of newspapers, photography, uh, was not very rich in this theater. So Historians of this region are working from a, a much smaller source base. Um, and, and there's a reason why we don't have many Confederate accounts um, of the road to Valverde um, or this battle or what happened after uh, as well, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So the U.S. Army also included, uh, in addition to Army regulars and Anglo volunteers, the first New Mexico volunteers, Hispano soldiers under the command of Colonel Kit Carson, who is another protagonist in the book, someone we usually associate with frontier warfare, with Indian scouting. He was a colonel in the army. He took part in this part of the war and in the war against native peoples. There were also Hispano militias, which were brought in only a day or two before the Battle of Valverde, not really trained, had guns in their hands, often for the first time. There were also Hikarilla Apache and Ute spies, um, men who Carson had known when he was an Indian agent for their communities. Uh, and he brought them in uh, to the US Army to track Confederate movements. So here's another interesting thing when we look at the Southwest. This is one of the most diverse, racially and ethnically diverse armies to take the field in the Civil War. And this is more than a year before the Emancipation Proclamation would bring black soldiers in to the fight in the Eastern Theater. Valverde was a victory, as I said, for the Confederates, but 
The Federals had successfully defended Fort Craig. So the Confederates had to keep moving. And here's where we see the failure of tactics and strategy in favor of the supremacy of logistics, right? You have to be able to feed and clothe an army on the move. You have to be able to keep them moving in order to sustain a campaign. And Sibley's whole idea rested on this idea that they were gonna be able to sack these forts. So first test, Fort Craig failed that test. Moved on, took Albuquerque, took Santa Fe. But the US troops had burned or otherwise taken all of their supplies with them in those two cities, so that didn't help. Um, by the middle of March, uh, things were getting pretty dire again, uh, and it was determined uh, that the Confederates had to move once again on the Santa Fe Trail to the Northeast to try and take Fort Union. Fort Union had been established as a frontier fort. It sat on the Santa Fe Trail, uh, right where the Cimarron cutoff comes and meets the mountain route and then takes off toward Santa Fe. It was a huge installation. It had a lot of warehouses, again, full of forage and food uh, and all kinds of war materiel. And of course, uh, Sibley wanted that fort. So Confederate troops set out from uh, set out from Santa Fe to take Fort Union. They never made it there. Uh, they instead ran into an advance guard of US troops who had been newly recruited and marched down from Denver, most of them gold miners. They met them at Apache Canyon on March 26. That battle was a bit of a draw. Um, the Confederates were reinforced overnight, continued and pushed on, and met in the Battle of Glorieta Pass uh, two days later um, at on March 28th. So this was another one of these kind of fascinating battles. It started on a roadway, then the soldiers fanned out into what was a pretty mountainous, rocky, forested situation. It did, kind of devolved into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, the troop strengths were about 1,100 on the Confederate side, about 1,300 on the US side. Those troops were being led by a guy named John Slew, who was a lawyer from Denver. Again, no military experience whatsoever. This was technically a Confederate victory. They pushed the US forces back, but SLU, remember, a lawyer, had read a lot of military books, and he had discovered the joy of the flanking maneuver. And so he had actually sent about a third of his army up Glorietta Mesa to the south, under the leadership of John Shivington and a Hispano officer. They came around the Confederate troops, destroyed their entire wagon train, and dispersed all of their horses and mules. So the Confederates, feeling like they had this victory at the end of the day, received this news that their entire wagon train was destroyed. And William Scurry, the lieutenant colonel who's in, in charge of this action because Sibley was back in Albuquerque at this point, um, knew in an instant that the, their campaign was over. Again, logistics. They no longer had any of their kits. They could not feed themselves. They, all of their horses and mules were depleted. They had no choice but to retreat to Santa Fe and then retreat from Santa Fe all the way back to San Antonio, a thousand mile retreat starting in April, ending in July. If any of you have ever been in this part of the country during the summer, you will know why the Sibley Brigade had about 30% casualties, mostly due some, some injuries and deaths in battle, um, some were taken prisoner, most of them dehydration, sunstroke, malnutrition, just fell by the wayside and were left behind. Also what happened, <clears throat> this is going back to my comments about Alonzo Ickes, in the burning of that wagon train, we lost all the Confederate records of the movement from San Antonio to Glorieta Pass. So this is the Gettysburg of the West, as it is termed, um, which is you know, the high water mark of the Confederacy in this region. Super interesting uh, battle to read about, a US victory. Um, you know, so historians are like, yes, but then we're like, no. Uh, 
we have lost all of these great sources. They were just burned up uh, and dispersed. So one of the, uh, just one of those battle uh, results that we don't usually think about. Again, like how does it affect the way that we think about and write about and study uh, theaters of war? So after, after this kind of, these first two phases, the US Confederate fight, what are, what are the results of this? Well, by the summer of 1862, the US Army controlled the West, 40% of the nation's landmass. The Confederates had little or no access to the larger West at this point, although they did maintain control of the Gulf Coast and, um, or most of the Gulf Coast, and much of the interior of Texas. This campaign, though, had some other interesting side effects. This meant economically the Confederacy had no access to gold mines. They had no access to Pacific ports. This made the US blockade even more effective than it would have been, right? So this affects the Confederacy economically. It drives them ultimately uh, to tax and kind, uh, to taking material from their own people, and a kind of civilian disenchantment uh, with the Confederate cause. Now militarily, US troops did not have to divert anyone at this point from other theaters to further defend the Western states and territories. So this means they retain all of their troop strength in other theaters of the war. Diplomatically, Mexico, who the Confederates were courting, did not recognize the Confederacy at this point. They could have. They decided not to at the end of this campaign. They also decided not to allow any kind of legal trade uh, through their northern states with Confederate troops. So again, issues of supply. This also gave credence, further credence, to Lincoln's argument with European powers uh, that the Confederacy was illegitimate, that they could not sustain themselves and they could not expand and control their own territory or anyone else's territory. And then politically, these campaigns actually allowed the Republicans in control of the US Congress in the spring and summer of 1862 to pass several measures to assert further control of the West. These were measures that they were trying to pass in the 1850s and they kept getting prevented by the power of Southern representatives and senators. The two most important here were the Homestead Act, passed in 1862, uh, spring of 1862, and the Pacific Railway Act, passed in the summer of 1862. These measures were meant to bring the empire of liberty into being, right? To give 50 acres of land to every person loyal to the Union. That is written into the Homestead Act. So no Confederates could take any action here, right? Um, these would be Northern Midwestern farmers that were working on their own and without uh, the labor of enslaved people. The Pacific Railway Act would be a technological feat that would bind the nation together from coast to coast. These measures also contributed to a push among the US armies during the Civil War itself in the field in the West to launch campaigns against native peoples. And this is where we see the beginning of phase three. So in this third phase of the war, <clears throat> Brigadier General James Henry Carleton, a career military man who had been posted at frontier forts his entire career, uh, brought a 2,000 man army, again, most of them gold miners from California, uh, from Los Angeles to the Rio Grande. So here we have another incredibly long march through a desert landscape. Carleton was a logistical genius. He sent men ahead to cache hay and to cache food, to clean out wells, to make sure that his men had water along the way. He staggered all of his troops so that when they moved along the road, they could manage water supplies. He also figured out pretty early on they needed to march at night. So most of those marches were sort of saving these soldiers from being depleted on the road. Remarkable that in this entire march, which took place um, from April to August, again, through the summer months, along basically what is now I-10. So think about that. 
your car ever broke down and you had to walk any distance in the summer heat. Think about how that might feel. Um, <clears throat> none of these men died or were knocked out due to dehydration or sunstroke or malnutrition. They lost a couple of men in a battle here at Picacho Pass with just a very small contingent of Confederates in April. They lost a couple of men in a fight with the Chiricahua Apaches in July at Apache Pass, which was the home of the only water source in a 60 mile radius. So the US had to control that water source and they ultimately did. Um, but no men were lost for any other reason because Carlton had trained them so well and he had provisioned them so well. But what was also important um, in this campaign, the California Car column, and here's Carlton, um, looking like the sort of stern <laughs> badass that he was. Um, what he also learned along the way uh, is that he was going to uh, start to approach the US Army's relationship with native peoples differently. Now in the 1850s, US Army officers had actually been in control of establishing and negotiating treaties with native peoples. They were the men on the ground. Sometimes they had Indian agents with them, sometimes they didn't, uh, but the army was involved in that, uh, not uh, necessarily entirely the Department of the Interior or uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Carleton, you know, the, the tradition had been that first you start with treaties, then if Native people or the US Army break the treaties, then you might have a conflict, then that leads to other treaties, right? At this point, after the fight with the Chiricahuas at Apache Pass, Carleton became a hardliner. And he basically developed an entirely new Indian policy for the US Army in the West. He said, no more treaties, war first, to force a surrender, and removal to a reservation of my choosing. The site he chose was Bosque Redondo, uh, which was a 40 mile square patch of land along the Pecos River uh, in central New Mexico. Uh, he chose it just because he liked it. He had sent officers out to scout it. They said, you really shouldn't establish it here. The water is not great. There's not enough wood. Um, move it 40 miles north. But he thought that was too close, close to the Santa Fe Trail. And what he wanted uh, was for native people to be out of the way of white migrants and soldiers who are coming down the Santa Fe Trail. So he ignored their advice and he established, he built Fort Sumner uh, on this, this patch of land and then began several different campaigns uh, to force the removal of native people to this site. In the fall of 1862, he launched campaigns against Mescalero Apaches uh, under Kit Carson and Chiricahua Apaches under Joseph Rodman West, who was another one of his favorite commanders who was with him in the California column. They achieved quick success against the Mescaleros, about 400 of them went to Bosque Redondo pretty early on. Uh, Joseph Rodman West could never bring the Chiricahuas to battle. Uh, Mangus Coloradus, who was a legendary war chief, another one of the protagonists in the Three Cornered War, actually came into parley. He wanted to establish a sort of peace treaty um, for the season so that he could bring his people home. They could um, maybe farm a little and rest. Um, Carlton refused to meet with him. Um, when he came into parley, US troops took him prisoner and then murdered him in January of 1863. <clears throat> in his cell. They thought that this would kind of quell the Apache unrest, because um, you know you kill a commander and then maybe the, the soldiers are not um, very organized. Um, the exact opposite happened. This was the moment that sparked the Apache Wars that continued uh, into the 1880s in the Southwest. The Chiricahua Apache people against the US Army. In the fall of 1863, uh, Carlton sent Kit Carson back out again uh, to engage in some hard war strikes against the Navajo or Diné people uh, in uh, kind of the northwestern part of what is now New Mexico and, and northeastern part of Arizona. Um, he and his men burned their fields, their orchards, their winter hogans, which were their, their winter shelters, uh, any fields they came across took sheep uh, from the Navajo, which were the source of both meat and also um, 
uh, blankets and clothes um, from the shearing of the wool and the weaving of it, which women uh, were in charge of. They followed this up with a winter campaign in January of 1864 at Canaan de Chez, which was the beginning of a wave of forced surrenders, which ultimately brought 10,000 uh, Navajo or Diné to Bosque Redondo between 1864 and 1866. This is known, um, the kind of forced removal, which was a 400 mile forced march, mostly on foot of Navajos from their homeland to Bosque Redondo is known as the Long Walk, uh, collectively uh, in Navajo history um, and Bosque Redondo is known as Wealdy, or the land of suffering. Um, Wealdy should be understood as a prisoner of war camp. Carleton called uh, the Navajos his prisoners in all of his correspondence and all of his reports. The soldiers at Fort Sumner were there to control and surveil them and to keep them on the reservation. If any of them left, they were chased down and brought back. Carlton's sort of legendary logistical genius broke down in this instance. Um, <clears throat> partly it was due to envi environmental factors having to do with the poorly chosen site of Bosque Redondo. Partly I think it was due to racism. He was not taking as much care uh, of his Navajo prisoners as he was taking care of his own Anglo soldiers. Uh, but what ended up happening is that there was massive flooding along the Pecos and insects that destroyed the corn crops that Navajo peoples were raising to feed themselves. There were problems with provisioning. They could not get enough uh, meat or flour uh, to the native peoples at the reservation. Uh, this led to massive starvation. There were also no woodlands for building any shelters at all. So what you see instead are kind of these, wood, or these mud huts where they're sort of dug into the ground and covered over uh, with some mud and sticks um, and then um, either some blankets or any other kinds of hides that they may have had available. And what this means is there was a 25% mortality rate. Mortality, not casualty, mortality rate at Bosque Redondo. And that you know, can sit side by side with Andersonville, I think, as a really disastrous <clears throat> POW situation. Um, I tell the story of the long walk and Bosque Redondo in the book um, through the experiences of Juanita, uh, who was married to the Diné headman, um, Manuelito. She was with him the entire time, so I was able to track her through space. Uh, she was also a master weaver, so she was demonstrating for me the power of women uh, in this culture to feed and clothe their families uh, and also produce blankets for a a really expansive regional trade. Navajo blankets then as now are very valued items <clears throat> and extremely, extremely valuable in trade. Um, her story really helps us to understand a different kind of a civilian experience uh, of warfare and also to understand how the line between the Indian Wars and the Civil War that military historians have often traditionally drawn is not so clear. Right? Um, in the West, the Civil War was an Indian War. Okay, so finally, what do we learn when we look at the Civil War from a new vantage point, from the Southwest? Uh, well, first, as, as I've mentioned multiple times, uh, and this is what has really kind of brought me to, to really love military history, is the power and the influence and significance of logistics. Um, it's incredibly just obvious in this theater how important that is and how much more we have to pay attention to that aspect of warfare um, because it really drives um, tactics and strategy. Also the impact of long distances. Uh, this is unique to the far Western theater, I think in some ways, because these armies and civilians were on the move for such huge expanses the, their survival was really dependent on a lot of different things um, than in other theaters of the war. The importance of natural resources, wood, and also especially water. The human body can go for three weeks without food, but only three days without water. And that's in the best possible conditions when you're not sweating out 
a lot of your own <clears throat> bodily fluid on a really, really hot and dry day. Um, it also shows us hard war in a different place at an earlier time than we're used to thinking about it. Uh, in the Civil War, we usually associate it maybe with Pope, with Sherman in the Eastern Theater. Uh, here we're seeing Kit Carson and Carleton put hard war into play uh, at an earlier moment in the war. Also, we see commanders left to their own devices, right? They are out there in a region with no telegraph, no train. If they are going to ask for orders or permission, it will take a month to get that back. It takes two weeks to get the message out, two weeks to get a reply, right? So they were just <clears throat> acting on their own, on both sides, through this entire uh, conflict in this region. It also shows us the importance of territorial acquisition and control. A lot of times we pay attention only to battlefield victories and losses, but what about territorial gain and loss? How does that kind of work into our assessment of what is a successful army? What is a failure in you know, military terms? Uh, and what is in fact important in the history of warfare? Um, and now just a little bit of data about these small armies in the field. If you think about their effectiveness on the ground, I'll, just th I'll throw some numbers at you here. So in the Eastern Theater, <clears throat> over four years of war, the central armies in the field, the US armies gained and retained 65.3 acres per soldier. The Confederate armies gained and then lost 0.76 acres per soldier. In the Southwest, in one year of warfare, the US armies gained and controlled 83,853 acres per soldier. And the Confederates, even though they failed in their campaign, in doing so, they took 37,876 acres per soldier. So if we think about that as a measure of achievement, of success, or of failure, I think we can really see these armies having an outsized impact uh, for their size, right? Really determining the fate of a huge region in the nation. We also learn that the Civil War had armies that are more diverse than we have considered and in a different way than we have considered previously. And that the Civil War was a fight between the US and the Confederacy and Native peoples. It was a fight between the North and the South and the West, and that it was therefore a truly national continental conflict. Thank you very much. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a few minutes for a question and answer. I've got Rodney right over here who will come around for anybody who's got a question, please raise your hand. Uh, we also will have some questions coming through online. Again, want to remind everybody in the chat room to go ahead and uh, send your emails through the chat room and we'll make sure they get in line. Let's go ahead and see, do we have anybody out here in the crowd that wants to get us started? They agree 100%. They are all on board. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Got a question from Rick. Oh, oh, I, we have one here. You alluded to the, the Confederacy wanting to expand in, in the Mexico, Latin America, and the Caribbean to expand slavery and, and make an empire. Mm -hmm. Was that alluded to, or is that like <clears throat> what in writing, con, you know, what, whatever, was that put in writing and in, in action, mm -hmm. or is that just what we think they wanted? Mm -hmm. Well, that, had, that whole vision had roots in the, the 1850s, right? In the expressed statements of pro-slavery and pro-expansion um, Southerners who then became Confederates, like Jefferson Davis, gave many speeches talking about expanding into the West, uh, talking about uh, you know, slavery being a pivotal and important institution in establishing um, this expanding empire. Um, at that point, he was seeing it more as a nation uh, that was the United States and not the Confederate, Confederacy itself. But he continued um, to articulate that vision during the war itself. And um, the Confederate Congress did as well when they created, uh, they actually did after Baylor kind of just sat down and created con the Confederate 
territory of Arizona uh, out of nothing, um, the, the Confederate Congress actually did pass an act, the Arizona Organic Act, creating that territory and establishing slavery as legal forever. Um, and then added a, a little segment saying, and in any other territories gained. So they were providing for an expansive confederacy. And there was a group called the Knights of the Golden Circle that was um, a little bit secretive, but they were known to be kind of creating plans based on the filibustering model um, of the, the men in the 1850s who had gone into Central America to try and establish um, nations of enslavement there as well. Um, so this was all kind of connected. There was not one kind of press release that sort of said, you know, this is what the Confederacy wants, um, but you were hearing the articulation of that vision in a couple of different ways from politicians, um, mostly, um, but also from, to some extent, um, military leaders like Henry Hopkins Sibley, who in his campaign report is talking about that vision of expansion. And he was the one actually who sent, he sent one of his officers to go negotiate with Mexico um, to try and get friendly, friendly relations with them so that they could um, not only move uh, war material through those northern territories of Mexico, but then also potentially to establish a military presence there. Yes, sir. You mentioned there were no trains and no telegraph mm -hmm. systems. Were there scouts on either side who were basically working as spies or mm -hmm. intel people? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, there were. Um, there, Baylor had actually sent a group of um, Arizona Rangers out to Tucson, and their job was to kind of scout the road, which was a mail route, um, for all the way from Tucson to the California border. And they were doing that when they ran into those advanced troops of Carlton's at Picacho Pass. So um, they were meant to be kind of out there figuring out what was going on, and they did have contacts in Southern California, pro-secessionists, pro-slavery people who were just kind of waiting for the Confederate Army to get there so that they could then join them and establish control of their communities. Uh, U.S. troops were, again, using indigenous scouts and spies. They were also using local guys on the ground to try and figure out where the Confederates were coming from. They actually didn't know for sure where Sibley was. Um, or where he was planning to go. They thought he might come up the Pecos in central Texas instead of along the Rio Grande. So they had men out. Kit Carson had actually sent them out and was getting reports from them relatively regularly. Um, and he also had um, contacts in the Hispano community. He was married into the Jaramillo family, which was a very prominent uh, Rico family in New Mexico. And they had contacts everywhere. And those folks were also sending him reports about what they were seeing. And ultimately they were like, oh, he's coming up the Rio Grande. <laughs> but um, yeah, so they, they were on both sides. They had some information gathering, um, but it was not really, really far. Although the, um, the men under Sherrod Hunter who were in Tucson, when they heard the news of Picacho Pass, they just turned and they left Tucson because they had heard there were there was this huge army on the march, um, and they had gained intel in other ways as well, which I talk about in the book, and made their way back to Messia and told them. And that was part of, when Sibley got back to Messia and he knew the Californians were coming, then he just kind of gave up and went home. All right, Dr. Nelson, we have the next one's coming from online. It's a two-part question, so I'll <laughs> read it right here to you. Yep. All right, did the Confederacy's failure in the Southwest materially damage its international standing? Mm -hmm. Would it have been better to discourage an underfunded, long-shot expedition and focus on defendable and defined borders? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that diplomatically, this loss was a big problem for the Confederates. Um, this was, especially with Mexico, which could have been a good ally to the Confederates, um, again, because they had recently lost a war to the United States and might want some revenge. Um, but they completely lost that opportunity um, because of uh, the failure of this campaign. Also because, and you'll read about this in the book too, Baylor, true to his character, uh, kind of went off and um, decided to go chase 
uh, Apaches into Mexico. They actually crossed the national border uh, and killed two Apache enslaved people um, in, in a town in Chihuahua, and that was not well received and almost kind of uh, sparked an international incident uh, with Mexico. So uh, that, I think, was a, a big problem for them. And you know, they were never really successful in getting European powers to recognize them, but this you know, didn't help them in that regard. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you see it from Jefferson Davis's point of view, I mean, Sibley is telling him he can raise an army and take a huge region of the United States and secure ports and, and access to gold mines for basically no money and no troop commitment from Davis in the Eastern Theater. So I think he's thinking initially, why not? Right. Plus, Baylor has that first amazing success. And in the first part of the campaign, in the first part of Sibley's campaign, he was successful, right? He was marching right up the Rio Grande. He took Albuquerque, he took Santa Fe, the capital of the territory. That happened very rarely for the Confederates, right? So like, and this was pretty early on and, it, and this was very good progress. Um, and if they had not lost their wagon train, if they had been successful in taking either Fort Craig or Fort Union, I mean, they could have established a foothold. It would have depended on, on what uh, Camby was able to do with the men that he had in the field. But um, I think the initial plan was, seemed reasonable to Jefferson Davis and to the other powers uh, in control of the Confederate Army. In your research, were you able to discern how the civilian leadership of the Confederate Confederacy went about determining why they would devote all of these scarce resources of the military to the West when the center of power that they were fighting against was north of the Mason-Dixon line? Mm -hmm. You mean the Confederates? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, in Jefferson Davis's view, this was not actually devoting a ton of resources, right? I mean, these 3,000 Texans were not, they had not yet volunteered for the Confederate Army. So they were recruited, which is an interesting question. They don't, you know, a lot of these guys don't talk about why they didn't volunteer to begin with uh, for Confederate troops and other, to be deployed in other theaters. They ultimately ended up fighting in other theaters. Uh, for the Confederate Army because they mustered in for three years and they fought in other places. Um, but I think Jefferson Davis thought 3,000 Texans who aren't otherwise engaged, who are providing their own horses and their own guns and they're gonna subsist themselves on the road. We don't really have to do much of anything. The only money outlay was for uh, you know these lances that Sibley had made <laughs> for part of his troops because he was so enamored of them in the fight with Mexico. Um, and he armed uh, his cavalry with some of them and the, the US troops looking at them across the field at Valverde were like, what? And they, of course, in, in the fight with the Coloradans. So um, often stabbed to death with their own, their own lances. So it wasn't actually that much outlay from the Confederate treasury and the upside was gonna be huge if they could actually make it work and make it happen. Um, once it failed, then of course, um, even though Baylor kept trying, he ultimately got elected to co the Confederate Congress, by the way, um, after being removed from the army um, for his actions in the Southwest, um, he kept trying to convince the Confederate Congress to go back and, and invade again, and they just never considered it. Um, because I think they thought, what they learned from this campaign is that any real successful effort to take it was gonna take more money and more man manpower than they had. Uh, and they needed to devote all of that to the Eastern Theater. All right, Dr. Nelson, we'll take one more from there in the front row and then I have one more online. Okay. You mentioned at the beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, about the lack of information on the war, <clears throat> Civil War in the West. Mm -hmm. About 15, 20 years ago, I made my first trip to Tucson Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely flabbergasted driving down, I think it was I-10 between Phoenix and Tucson, yeah. to see the sign that said Civil War Battlefield yeah. Ahead. Uh -huh. I, mean, I, I couldn't oh, believe it. And the next Sport day, Billy. I had yeah. to go find it. And I found 
my takeaways from there mm -hmm. was that that battle of, I say it wrong, of Picaccio Pass. Picaccio Pass. Picaccio yep. Pass was what stopped the surprise attack mm -hmm. on Tucson. And it's also listed as the westernmost battle mm -hmm. of the Civil War. And the smallest, talking about commitment, the smallest numbers of people committed to the battle. Yes. So yeah, I it was very like fascinating five to find, or six guys. find yeah. that. I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Well, and this this is one of the really interesting ironies of the war in this theater is that, you know, very few people even really know about it, including people who live in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, and it's not particularly well signed all of the time. But because of the nature of that landscape, most of those battlefields are still there and have been preserved, and you can go see them. So Picacho Pass, still there. Apache Pass, still there. Um, you can go to Glorieta. Apache Canyon is in private hands, as is Valverde. Valverde actually belongs to Ted Turner, of all people. Um, it is part of his massive cattle ranch uh, in the middle of New Mexico. I'm, this is my other, I have a lot of campaigns, but the, one of my other campaigns is to try to get Ted Turner to give Valverde to the state of New Mexico or to the federal government to preserve. Um, you know, the, there are cannons that sit right in the middle of the plaza in Albuquerque that are Civil War cannons. There, you know, the, there, the war presence is there. You can go to Fort Craig. Um, you can see you can see all the almost all the forts except for Fillmore, which was destroyed. But um, a lot of those forts are still there and are still standing, kind of in adobe ruins. And you can go see them. And it's because they have not been mowed down or developed into suburban developments. They have not been really intensively settled. Um, so there's this great irony that like nobody knows about, uh, well, not nobody, but like very few people know about um, these conflicts. You can go to Bosque Redondo, you can go to Canyon de Chez, you can, you know, in Navajo history, this moment is extremely important and well recorded. Um, but, but it's all still there. You can still go see it partly because it is ignored. So this is, this is one of the fascinating ironies of the public history of the war in the Southwest as well. Yeah, and you can go up um, to get to Apache Pass. You either have to drive on an eight mile sandy road that goes through several dry arroyos um, or up this other road, which is notorious for popping tires on cars um, that goes by this land owned by a cult. Um, so it is a very strange situation, but it is a park service site and you can go there and the 62 ruins of the fort there are still there. Um, and then the later Fort Bowie um, ruins are there as well. Um, and there's interpretation and there's access. You will be all by yourself, most likely, um, but you can still go. All right, ma'am, we have one more question from the, uh, from the internet. Uh, we only have a couple minutes uh, to, to answer it, though, but I think it's, uh, I, I'm very interested to know the answer as well. Okay. How accurately does the film, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, portray the situation <laughs> in the Southwest in 1862? And I think that's a good final question. Oh, Carl, I could go on and on and on. On and on. Um, the question was about how accurate is the movie The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which purportedly takes place in New Mexico during Sibley's campaign. Um, at one point, I think they each dress up as US and Confederate soldiers to try and like get through the, the battle scene. The most famous scene in that movie is when they blow up a bridge across the Rio Grande. There were no bridges across the Rio Grande, much less a glorious, beautiful bridge like the one in the movie. Um, no, that, that movie is about 98% inaccurate, is the short answer on that. Great movie, completely insane from a historical perspective. Thank you for listening to our lecture. The U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, USA is an integral part of the U.S. Army War College and maintains the knowledge repositories that support scholarship and research about the U.S. Army and its operating environment.
To learn more about the Army's history or to plan a visit to our center, please visit us online at www.usahec.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to learn more about past and upcoming events.